I wanted to make sure that the cubes were of a material that would last in space. And eventually we had it made using 3D printing. It's a great pleasure to be here today to celebrate the feature of two locally designed and built artworks in the world's first extraterrestrial art gallery. Even now I have to pinch myself to say, yo, well, it's, it's actually true and it is going to the moon and it is going into space. The rocket is going so fast that the pressure on the rocket is the most. And so once it's past that, the likelihood of something going wrong reduces. We just received the news that the payload is scheduled to be launched at 1739 UTC. The payload was prepared, tested and delivered uh, to NASA. Oh, this is excellent news. All the artists are a big part of how the Moon Gallery is shaped. I'm an architect and a fashion designer by training, and you can see that what I do is I translate all my work into things that are related to fashion. I also like to bring my architectural training into my work. There was someone who was following my art, and then I explained it further to him over a cup of coffee, and he said, well, you know what, I think your art should be on the moon. And then he actually introduced me to them, and that's how I got invited to be part of the Moon Gallery you have these hundred artworks from around the globe done by various artists going to be placed on the moon as the very first extraterrestrial art gallery in the world. But before that, it's going to the International Space Station just in a few days from now. So these are really the cubes that are going to the moon. There is a limit set by the moon gallery, so you can only have an artifact that's under the size of a centimeter cube. And the reason we've made the larger cube is so that you can visually see it better. So these are the four faces that represent symbols that are universal, global symbols that people from all parts of the world can identify with. If you look at the spiraling shape, it's the shape of creation, the unfurling of a leaf, the unwinding of a spool of thread, and it's also the shape of a DNA. I wanted to make sure that the cubes were of a material that would last in space. I realized it had to be in some kind of metal. I tried making the cubes in a number of materials from titanium, steel, 3D printed, wire cut, and eventually we had it made using 3D printing. I am short for a man, tall for a lady. Okay. <laughs> my best feature is my hair because there's so few of them. Oh. <laughs> I'm wearing a Japanese print dress. <laughs> yes, and I recently just dyed my hair. Oh, like bright red? Like... Bright red. Can't miss me in the dark. <laughs> um, I can probably miss you. <laughs> <laughs> can. Carries will be passing you blindfolds. These blindfolds are specially made for this program. So before we begin, maybe I can just quickly introduce myself. I have a visual impairment in case you couldn't already tell. So things like I can see you sitting in front of me, but I can't tell what you look like. I cannot tell whether we are smiling or not. Like now I can still see a bit. team and I create meaningful experiences for visitors across all age groups. We interact quite regularly with communities with disabilities, especially during the pre-COVID era where um, many centres or social service organisations came through the museum. Welcome to Up Close with ACM, a really special collaboration between the Asian Civilization Museum and Dialogue in the Dark Singapore. I'm Joan and I'll be your facilitator for today. So you see all the boxes on the table. Please do not touch them or remove them first because you'll ruin the surprise for yourself. Under the boxes, there are 3D prints of real artifacts that are down in the exhibit that we'll be visiting later.
We were researching on tactile experiences across the world and we came across the concept of a touch tour or a tactile tour. We wanted their guides or the visually impaired facilitators to be more active contributors and collaborators of the museum instead of being passive receivers. And innovation came into the picture because uh, we wanted to tap on their expertise in additive manufacturing as well. Uh, we had to hire artifact handlers, professional artifact handlers, and they came down to the museum and they have to take um, these objects out of uh, their showcases, transport them to a room with a controlled temperature and environment, and Keppel Technology and Innovation as well as some of the uh, vendors had to scan our objects with a handheld scanner and this would produce a soft copy of an object and this gets sent to uh, the 3D printer in their lab and the 3D printer is able to read the file and print out the object. We printed about 20 unique pieces. The entire process was quite long because some of the objects are more complicated than others. The entire project with COVID in the picture was about one year in the making. This is a kneeling courtier this 3D print managed to replicate even the slightest details such as his hat string and also the folds of his robe here and the belt. And uh, this piece in particular is quite difficult to 3D print because um, as you can see there's many overhanging pieces and this had to be pieced together individually and then also painted over. Shall we start with the small cubes? Yeah, let's, let's yeah. take a few shots of the small ones. I'm going to take this one off so you can yeah. focus on that one. One of the things that I really enjoy the most about the collaboration is that it basically pushed me out of my comfort zone. We were talking about art, which is something that is obviously very different from what I do on an everyday basis. I can put some blue hue over here. Do you see the cube changing colour? Well, I see from my perspective, but maybe not from your I actually see a reflection of my, my, myself at the cube because it's so reflective. So the structure and reflectance cube was extremely interesting because it was a blend of art and technology. That was something that could not have been done with any other method. It's only with 3D printing that you could have molecules orienting in different directions. And so what happens is that as you shine the laser on the powder bed, the laser melts the powder, so it creates a, a you know a very small melt pool of liquid metal that solidifies very rapidly as soon as the laser moves away. What happens is that the laser starts by drawing the outline of the shape that you want to print, and then um, using some special uh, scanning patterns, what you end up with is is just a solid piece of metal only where the laser was scanning. So that's one single layer of the entire cube. That would be a square, if you think about it, right? And so the, the interesting thing is that if you control temperature during solidification of metals, you can basically control how metal crystals solidify, and we can control their shape. So that's what makes the cube unique, because we 3D printed a cube in which we only included two crystals that have different complementary geometry and also uh, orientation that basically mimics the design that Lakshmi came up with. Yeah, that's good. good. Photographing the cube has remained one of the biggest challenges because the cube also has two faces, like the near side and the far side of the moon. The crystals on the faces are oriented in two different directions. If you didn't have two different crystals, uh, the appearance would be uniform and you wouldn't have any contrast. So you need to have two crystals uh, because one can reflect light back into the camera and the other one is going to appear dark. Uh, you can change the lighting conditions or the position of the cube with respect to the viewing angle and then suddenly the other part uh, of the cube becomes bright uh, and, and the previous one gets darker. What we reflect as people is based on the light that's thrown at us or how we are perceived by other people and not necessarily what is really hidden inside of you. It's a strong red and a strong green. Though. Yeah. Nice. 
Initially, the team at NTU, they made a number of iterations and prototype after prototype with each iteration, they understood the kind of parameters that they had to change so that they would be able to print it correctly. So the whole process would have taken about six months to complete. Think of yourself like a printer or a scanner. You can start from the top and then fill all the way down. Or else you can fill from below and fill all the way up. This is generally how uh, blind people can't kind of figure out what they are feeling or touching. When I first told my friends that I was going to be a docent or going to be a guide at a museum, they were pretty amused. They were like, hi, you blind what? Then guide what? Yeah. <laughs> like, are there parts of your item that can be removed? I feel Joan actually carried out the role really well. It never occurred to me that she would ever have a visual impairment. I don't think that our museum is the first to utilize 3D printing, but to mesh them together uh, using facilitators with visual impairment to guide through the museum using 3D printed objects. I think that might be the first for the nation. They are sort of like um, petal shape in a way. Petal shape? Or so flower shape? Does anyone think you have the same artefact as anybody else? 3D printed objects are of course made from a particular kind of plastic, so that's um, far from the actual material of our objects, be it um, stoneware or textiles or metal. So um, this kind of tactile quality can't really um, be replicated. Um, things like weight as well would be hard to imitate. So um, I, I do think these are some limitations, but 3D printing is the next best option that we have as opposed to feeling an actual object and that also helps us preserve the integrity of the artefact. The gallery is integrated in a box, um, which you can also see here. On one side, it will be installed in the space station module where the camera will start capturing uh, the images, how the artworks are behaving or changing in the conditions of space. But at least they will... Uh, so the Moon Gallery started off with an idea and uh, these young curators came up with this idea that they wanted to send artwork to the moon. And then they got this team together because they are from the space and scientific community. And this is a fully autonomous cargo vessel, and so no people on board. Five, four, three, two. We are launch. That is 100% thrust at all. Go, go, go. Go, Moon Gallery. Woo. Yay! Congratulations to everyone. I was literally over the moon. There we go. Woohoo! And uh, that's Ooh. the integrating away. Even going to the ISS is a very interesting idea because the art will be literally orbiting every part of habitable Earth because the International Space Station orbits the Earth. Congratulations on your two cubes at the International Space Station. Minister in the Prime Minister's Office and Second Minister of Finance and National Development. We are proud to house the Satellite Research Centre, where faculty from various disciplines come together to push the boundaries of space technologies, sending over nine satellites into space since 2011. This is an exciting milestone in the arts and science realms and I congratulate Singaporean artist and designer Lakshmi Mohan Babu for this remarkable achievement. This is a story of an idea to communicate a universal message of inclusivity, an integrated worldview that resonates with people from all walks of life, regions, ethnicities, beliefs, and transcends racial and religious biases. I am 
absolutely delighted to be part of this whole uh, very, very historic venture. Okay, so get around. This is our first item. So would you like to tell us how similar slash different it is from your 3D prints? I think the 3D print really captured the whole structure very well. It's just that, uh, of course, this piece is much more colourful, mm -hmm. uh, more vibrant than the one that we have in the 3D printing. The 3D prints doesn't catch the colour, the details of the uh, moustache and all that. Okay. But in terms of outline, it is almost identical. What was really insightful for me was that my object was similar to the other participants, but yet, because of the angle, the point of view was completely different. So I guess it may sound very cliche, but actually it really depends on your point of view and the lenses that you apply. The same object can be viewed differently. Additive manufacturing is a complex process. Uh, there are a lot of things that can go wrong uh, during the process. It's, it's difficult to print two parts that are exactly the same. If you have slight variations of the process, maybe the laser is flickering or the powders are not exactly the same everywhere on the powder bed, you can actually have microscopic differences in the material and difference in the properties and the performance of the material. So that's the main challenge that additive manufacturing is facing, being able to make the process more repeatable and more consistent. The future of additive manufacturing is going to be is not only to create parts with uh, this complex geometries, but also leverage these capabilities of controlling the properties of these materials. To use 3D printing for artists is fantastic because in the first place, I'm looking at it from a very different point of view because it's not just art, I'm looking to print even accessories, be it jewellery, be it shoes, be it uh, wearable art, be it fashion. I think 3D printing is a great invention. With the 3D printed objects, it will be a waste for visually impaired clients or persons to not experience it. That's why we brought the objects to SAVH to let the blind community get a feel of our ASEAN objects as well. Hello! Can I please ask you a hand? Yeah, right. yeah, very cool. Very cool. <laughs> oh. Begins, can I ask you to sanitize your hands, please? Oh, thank you. After touching the artifacts from ACM, Y'all will do something similar to... Well, I'm quite excited to find out what is this uh, 3D item because as you know, in museums you can't touch anything. So now I'm able to feel the object. I think I'm quite excited about it. This could be the beginning, right? Today we try out with the 3D printer objects as a learning point as well on ways that we can improve the museum experience next time. Okay? Okay. I'm meeting Miss Singapore Universe and to have a collaboration with her is something I would really look forward to. You were saying that these days the girl who becomes the next Miss Singapore and Miss Singapore Universe is not just about being a pretty face. Of course, there's so many things in terms of like who she is as a person, what she stands for. You know, we all are symbols what we wear, what we say, these are all symbols. So when we're yeah. kind of looking at a universal kind of idea, that might change over time. But what we see as symbols will mm. probably stay for a long time. What I've done is I've actually translated these cubes into things that are products. 
so cool. These could end up being like shoe heels. Yeah. She's really put all the essence of who she is as a person into her art. It feels to me that already just by looking at her art, I know who she is. To explore the possibility of combining that into fashion and showcasing that on the Miss Universe platform would be groundbreaking. can touch and feel what it is. Okay, I'm placing I'll the object in front place of Place it in front of Adeline first. Ah, it's quite fragile. Okay. Oh, careful. Okay, so you can just open. When we want to go to somewhere, there is so many access points that we are looking. Is there a, going to be a queue? Where is the barricade going to be? But when we bring the museum objects to the studio here today, it's a place where they are very comfortable and relaxed. I feel very excited. At least we can feel the item and not just uh, being described to us by the sighted friends. So you can actually hold it. Uh, and then what they do is... I would say that like it's an elephant added yeah. object. I think the session went really well. I was really heartened to hear that the participants were really fascinated over our objects. And one participant even remarked that she wanted to go to the museum to feel more objects, which I feel that is our objective fulfilled. This is a very old object. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's antique. Yeah. But how do you do it? It's so nice. <laughs> The ISIS orbits the Earth about 15 and a half times a day. There's a website and you can actually have a look at what time it flies over Singapore and then you look up and you can actually see it. It's kind of like my generation where we didn't have internet. So the next generation when they, they are growing up with probably with 3D printers in their household, they are going to find it an everyday kind of routine to just create a piece of art on the computer and then have a printout of that. So I do feel that art might be viewed differently as well because of the kind of possibilities that are there to pursue.